Hello everyone. For those of you who are here for Art Appreciation, you're here now on the lecture that still is concerned with the visual elements, but today we're addressing uh, the idea of space and how to create it and the, you know, the illusion of 3D on a 2D surface. But let's start out with the idea of how space manipulates your viewer. The use of space, it implies different things and is the hardest element in the in works of art to manipulate, absolutely. And we know that large open spaces in relation to human figures give people a feeling of anxiety, while closed little spaces can imply intimacy unless they're too tight. Then, it, then that too can create anxiety. So as the artist, you manipulate those things to make your viewer feel certain ways. Architects are the most concerned of all of the practitioners of the arts, the visual arts, with space because they really do have to use it to create living that is comfortable and yet at the same time functional. So they absolutely have to think of space all the time. When we think of space, we think then of what's how much room is around us. And there are different ways to imply this concept, but let's start with the ideas associate with how to make your viewer feel. The use of space certainly can create varying meanings. And if you do have a figure like this set into a wide open space like you're looking at, you're going to get this feeling of loneliness. It'll give you this feeling of anxiety. Think about sitting in a big room. For instance, let's, let's use an example. If I told you that tonight or if it's nighttime already, so right now, you would be sitting in a big gymnasium and I'm going to tell you, you're going to sleep in here and I turn all the lights out and I'll leave. Most often people feel very insecure in that kind of setting and what will happen is they try to find a way to create smaller and more intimate spaces by say like moving, say if you had a cot, over into a corner. It's that visceral fear we have of laying out in the open. I mean, this comes down to us from, you know, caveman days, a Pleistocene era. When humans are still hunter-gatherers, you never slept outside in an exposed spot. If you've ever tried it, you know what I'm talking about. And by the way, I forgot to say my intro. Good morning. Hello. How are you? This is Dr. A uh, posting here for Art Appreciation on History Surfer. So that's the idea of space in a small human figure in a big wide open space. Let's go the opposite. Now I have a really tight, tight composition. This is a photograph, so the image is way tighter as far as how close you are to that person. The v and when I say you, I mean you as the viewer. And it feels very intimate. It also, this particular image can be very disturbing, this kind of feeling, because how often do you actually get this close to a person? I mean, very, very rarely. Somebody you kiss, you know, so it is, it's, it's definitely very intimate. And in fact, a lot of people, due to their own personal space, find this very uncomfortable, these kind of images. So I'm manipul manip excuse me, manipulating you as the viewer by creating a piece of Art like this. Space most often is, like I said, an architect's concern. Again, big wide open spaces are necessary for public spaces. And let me just move this down a little bit. There you go. So you get a better view of it. And you certainly don't want to cram a bunch of people into a public space and then keep the roof very low because what happens is it feels very claustrophobic. I can still, on that first floor, this is a Ronald Reagan airport by the way, on that first floor I could still 
have the ceiling lowered and fit the same amount of people in it but it would feel very different if I didn't have the roof high like that that's going to give you a feeling of being able to breathe all right versus if I'm designing a bedroom big open space again go back to the gymnasium feeling not going to be as comfortable that's that's a given we hardly ever see really giant large bedrooms and if we do like say in a big mansion you're gonna see the space usually cut up a little bit visually with devices like screens and furniture you know and the bed will be set back so it's always something to make you feel more protected and that's what it comes down to in architecture I mean you got to think of why people feel that way ways to create the illusion of space in two dimensions are major concern of 2d artists all right how are you going to make this person feel that this piece of art you're creating is three-dimensional that's what you want to imply when it's actually flat remember we spoke in the previous lecture lecture number two this is lecture number three about 2d versus 3d so let's talk about different ways to create that one of the ways you can do that is through value using lightness and darkness let me back this up a little bit so you can see that there you are chiaroscuro is one way to manipulate your viewer into believing there's 3D. So we have this image of this woman and we want to say it's a woman because it's an illusion of something that has three dimensionals. Three, excuse me, three dimensions, sorry. So what you do is you would darken areas like this, like here under her thigh. Because what happens is the light falls into this room. It's coming from about here. All right, the light source. The artist says, okay, if I want to make them think this has depth, what I'll do is I'll make the top lighter like it can, it takes up space, it has mass to it, and it's blocking the light from getting to this part of her body. The use of chiaroscuro is achieved through manipulating values. Values are, and we're going to talk about that some more when we get into the discussion on color. I'm going to talk about values some more. So I'm just trying to make this a little more even. Sorry, I hate to move the camera around on you, but it does bother me. So anyway, so that's one way. And you can do that here. This is drawing. And in painting, you can see the artist has done that. Look right here on the jug. We have it's dark, implying light is falling in here on a three-dimensional object, but it's actually in two dimensions. In two dimensions, really, essentially, this is all a trick. There's no in front of or in back of, but I'm implying that by using value in the technique of chiaroscuro. All right, something that became very popular to use beginning in the Renaissance. The simple ways to imply depth that have always been around, and you probably may have some experience with some of these because when you're a child, children intuitively know some of these things, are overlap, diminishing size, and vertical placement. So let's start with overlap. In overlap, if I put a figure like this in front of that figure or shape, because start thinking of these as shapes, then what you're going to feel is if this is in front of that and then this little paw right there creates the illusion this little dog is in front of this man. There's no in front of or in back of in these images. You have to realize that essentially. All right, but that's what I want you to say. I want you to say that, oh, he's in front of that. Doesn't exist, it's 2D. But I want you to feel that if I'm the artist, so that's what I do. So diminishing size is another way to do this. You create the idea that this is bigger than that. Although certainly on a two dimension, I mean, excuse me, yeah, I was right, a two dimensional picture plane they're exactly on the same plane. 
One is not in front of. They're not receding away from you. They're exactly the same. And last but not least, diminishing size. If I start making this stuff smaller here, you can see that smaller, and then that's even smaller, that figure back there, then you're going to feel as if that stuff is moving away from you. It's not. There's diminishing size, which I've already spoken about, but vertical placement, I wanted to point that out with figures. Sorry, I should have made that, that point. But the last one was vertical placement. Things that are closer to the bottom here, in this part of the picture plane, feel closer to you as the viewer. So anytime you put things down in front of the image, and I'm saying in front, but remember it's really not, on the lower vertical plane, viewers are going to think it's closer to them, and it's not. So those are three very easy ways, in addition to using the manipulation of values in chiaroscuro. But by the time we get to the Renaissance, we have this emergence of perspective. Perspective was a systematic way to create the illusion of depth. Okay, it's going to become very much a part of the ideas of people like Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was fascinated by it. But before we get there, let's talk about what other things there were available. First of all, for most of the world, isometric perspective existed. And in isometric perspective, everything is on the same picture plane. Nothing is in front of or in back of. Uh, it's traditionally used in Asian arts. It's a great example. It's why we always use it. And especially you may be used to seeing it because they use it in video games. Those of you who are gamers. There's no horizon line and no vanishing points. And we'll talk about what those are. It just looks as if everything's happening right up here. And there's, here's the word, in front of everything. All right, but there's no back here. Look, there's no trees, there's no landscaping, there's really little attempt to make you feel that this is 3D. There's some things, I mean, absolutely, you can't avoid them always, there's overlap, yep. But, it's, it's all on the same picture plane, and that was okay for most of the world. African arts, pre-Columbian arts of Latin America, the arts of the Aborigines in Australia, they all are using isometric perspective. It's going to be in the Western tradition that we see the emergence of a preoccupation with creating the illusion of depth. So let's go and see another way besides linear, which we're working up to perspective, that you can create that illusion. In another form, you can use atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is when things become less distinct the further they are away from the front. Again, I'm using that, you know, tongue in cheek. You guys should be realizing there is no front, but this is the way they make you feel that. So things become blurry. The colors are muted. It looks like it's getting further away from you because, you know, when you look at things in the distance, they do look that way. They don't look like they're close to you. So think of it that way. All right. So, for instance, here in this image, this orangey red here is very bright. It, the intensity level is up. But back here, look at it, that little figure back there. It's very muted. And plus, look at that beautiful muting of the light in the back there. You know, it's this golden, hazy look. Very much taken from nature. And when you look at, especially on a very hot day, and this is Venice, uh, you know, a reproduction of Venice. So yeah, it would be hot there. So absolutely, this is the ideas that we come out of the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance in the West. Okay, so let's look at linear perspective. The most difficult to do, this is a system that tries to create three-dimensional forms on a two-dimensional surface. And what they use is they begin to draw all lines 
see those lines. Look at where they all meet. To me, at one point, so this is one point linear perspective. There's two point as well. But in this one, we're looking at an example of one point. To me, at one spot. So every line in this thing goes and meets at one point. It converges. And that point is called the vanishing point. And in most compositions, the vanishing point will be on the horizon line. It's very, like, almost a science, you know, for some people. Again, I'll reference Leonardo. He was fascinated with it. So he would use, you know, big lines and, like, make, make it perfect when he was doing it. He wanted his linear perspective to really showcase itself. In linear perspective, that vanishing point is necessary to create that illusion again right out there. See all the lines? And then look at this composition. You can combine a bunch of things. Here we have linear perspective. We have diminishing size. We have vertical placement. We also have an atmospheric perspective in the back. So all of these things is kind of like an example of many of those techniques. And so with that, artists become more and more concerned with the idea of recreating reality. Another visual element we're going to address today is time and motion. How do you show that? If you don't have a moving picture camera, you know, you're going to have to depend on some other tricks. Time is the fourth dimension. It's non-spatial. So it's a difficult thing to address. So let's see what artists did. Well, the Egyptians came up with this idea. All right, let's make it like a story. And so this is like a cartoon. All right, we're uh, having things happen and they're moving along and what they're doing is implying that things are happening over a period of time. They also have the let the wording, you know, here with it telling you the story. And so here the weighing of the dead is explained and this is from the book of the dead. Okay, so you're having this weighing of souls, if you will. It's not going to be until we see the invention of film that we can actually concretely deal with time and motion. Motion is definitely something that up to that point they had to imply. All right. It's going to take a while for that development. And motion in the camera art, originally it's great strength was freezing things, stopping the motion at one point in, in this un, Henri Cartier-Bresson piece, the man forever is jumping into that pedal. That's the beauty of photography. I was a photographer, that was what I did, it was my medium. All right, so absolutely critical.